Hey everyone, so in this supplemental video, we're gonna go through the proof of the convergence properties for a geometric series. So in particular, we're wondering for a geometric series like the one written here, some number a times another number r raised to the power of the index minus one from n equals one to infinity, we're wondering why this type of series converges if that common factor of r is less than one in absolute values and why it actually diverges if that common factor r is greater than one or equal to one in absolute values. So this is the proof of what we're going to go through today. And there's gonna to be two parts to the proof, but before we get ahead of ourselves, just remind ourselves that the first couple terms of a geometric series all basically keep adding a subsequent factor of r onto the next term. As we go from a r to the zero plus a r to the first, plus a r squared, plus a r cubed, and then we go plus a r to the fourth and so on and so forth. So the first thing I want us to think is, well, this is a series like any other series for that matter, although it has a special property of being geometric, but the first thing we usually do with series is apply the test for divergence. So let's go ahead and apply the test for divergence to this geometric series up above. So remember the test for divergence, we take the limit as n goes to infinity of our series function, which in this case is that some number a times the other number r raised to the n minus first power. And we need that limit to equal zero to have a chance that the series converges at all. But if we actually look at this limit, this limit is gonna display a couple different properties for us. So for example, if R is just greater than one, basically what we find is this limit is infinity. If R is greater than one, and also if A is greater than zero for that matter as well. Now, what happens if R is equal to one, well, if R is equal to one, in this case, we just have A times R or A times one. As N goes to infinity, this limit's just going to be A. And of course, we're assuming that A doesn't equal zero. Otherwise, we just have a series of constant zeros. The other limit we have though, is what happens if R is less than minus one? Well, if R is less than minus one, not of course in absolute values, but if R is less than one, what we're basically going to see from the series is every subsequent term of the series will basically be positive, negative, positive, negative. But these terms are going to grow in magnitude and kind of keep bobbling up and down getting larger and larger. So if we looked in that limit as r, or in this case, some number less than one raised to the n minus one, and that limit as n goes to infinity, that's not going to exist because we're going to get this oscillation bouncing back and forth where those oscillations are getting larger. So this limit does not exist sort of in this other case in which r is less than minus one. And of course, in this case, we're assuming A doesn't equal zero as well. So in those three cases, basically what we see when R is equal to one, greater than one, or less than minus one so far, this series must diverge because the limit is not coming out to zero. But of course, there's this other, there's a couple other cases for us to consider here going to need to extend these curly brackets just a little bit. Swoop. But basically another case we can consider is what happens if R is equal to minus one? Well, if R is equal to minus one, this limit looks like the limit as N goes to infinity of A times negative one raised to the N minus one. And what this limit is going to look like, well, it's not going to exist. Every single term is gonna keep bouncing between positive A, minus A, positive A, minus A, and so forth. We're never gonna just get one number from this limit. So in this case, 
when r is equal to minus one, we also do we also get it does not exist. And of course, we assume a doesn't equal zero in this case as well. So that to say, the reason why a geometric series diverges when r is greater than or equal to one in absolute values is really because it doesn't pass the test for divergence. But there is one case we didn't consider. If r is any number between minus one and one, this limit is actually going to equal zero. So for example, if we pick something like let r equal minus two thirds, if we throw this into the limit and just test this value, so we have limit as n goes to infinity of a times minus two thirds raised to the n minus one. Well, what we're gonna see is there's gonna be oscillations going positive, negative, positive, negative, but that denominator is going to grow a lot faster than that numerator. So this limit's actually gonna come out to zero. And in fact, if we choose any number, r between negative one and one, this limit is going to come out to zero. So in terms of the test for divergence, we get a limit of zero, but we only get a limit of zero in the case in which r is strictly between negative one and one. Or in other words, when the absolute value of r is less than one. That's the only chance we have at a convergent series in this case. So just to reiterate, basically what we found from tests for divergence is that the only chance we have at a geometric series converging is if R is between negative one and one. We haven't actually proven that it converges there yet though. but we still need to prove this. Which brings us to part two of this proof for geometric series. We are really gonna see why in this case, when R is strictly less than one in absolute values, why we get a convergent series. So we're gonna step away from the test for divergence. So the test for divergence really just helped us narrow down what possible values of R could lead us to a convergence series. So we're thinking between negative one and one, we might have a convergent series, but we need to actually show that in fact, this series converges. So let's remember what our geometric series form was. It was a series n equals one to infinity of some number a, times another number r raised to the n minus first power. And we can write out the first couple terms accordingly, a plus ar plus ar squared plus ar cubed and so on and so forth. So what we're actually going to do is, we're just gonna start lift, listing out what we call partial sums. So for example, I'm gonna define s first, just to be the first entry in that sum. S2 is going to be the second partial sum, which is just going to be the sum of the first two terms of the series. S3 will be the sum of the first three terms. S4, the sum of the first four terms. And we could keep doing this on and on and on. But we might be picking up on a pattern now. So for example, in this fourth case, the highest power of R in that fourth partial sum actually turns out to be a three or one less than that partial sum value. So if we kept doing this, for example, the nth partial sum, well, it would be equal to that sum, A plus AR plus AR squared and so on and so forth. 
But the last term we would eventually have in that sum for the nth partial sum would be plus a r to the n minus first. So where are we going with this? Well, this is what we call the nth partial sum. It's the sum of the first n terms of the series. Next, we're gonna do a very slick kind of thing where we're just going to come across. So I'm gonna grab and make a copy of this last line here. And rather than look at the n plus first partial sum, I'm gonna come across and multiply both sides of that last line by r, that common factor. So let me actually clean up that right-hand side just a little bit. So all we did in this last step was just multiply both sides of the nth partial sum by that factor r. So why would we do this? Well, if we just go ahead and just uh, simplify this r times the nth partial sum a bit, this will be equal to a r plus a r squared plus a r cubed and so on and so forth. And then multiplying that last term by r will give us an a r to the nth power. So again, we just multiply the nth partial sum by this factor r. Now I'm actually gonna get rid of this middle line and move this last line upwards. And the reason for doing that is basically what we're going to do is just subtract this second equation from the first equation. So let's see what happens when we do that. So what we're actually going to compute is the nth partial sum minus r times the nth partial sum. So that's going to be on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we're basically taking the difference between those last two lines. So what we're going to see happen is, well, this ar is going to cancel out that factor of ar there. The ar squareds are going to cancel out we'll get another factor where the AR cubes are gonna factor out. And actually, let me just squeeze in before this last term here, you would have actually had another factor of plus AR to the N minus first. And those factors of AR to the N minus first would actually cancel out as well. So almost all of the terms cancel out on the right-hand side, except for two. The terms that survive is that first a term and this a times r to the nth term. So we have the difference between Sn or the nth partial sum and r times the nth partial sum equals a minus a r to the n. So, so what at this point? Well, we can actually solve for the nth partial sum itself. So we can just factor out an S sub n from both the sides on the left side. So we get S sub n times one minus R. And we can factor out a factor of A if we want on the right-hand side. So this is A times one minus R to the N. And then we can solve for that factor of S sub n by itself. So if we solve for that, we get this partial sum is equal to A all over one minus R times this other quantity, one minus r to the n. And actually, believe it or not, we are almost done with this proof. If we sit back and think about what this nth partial sum actually represents for us, this gives us the sum of the first n terms of the series. And it actually gives it to us in a very nicely closed form kind of way. As in, if I tell us an n, we can just put that value of n into the right-hand side like a function, and they'll just spit back a number for us. 
So if we want the sixth partial sum, we could just plug six in for n at this stage. If we wanted the 21st, we could plug in the 21st value or the 21st um, in for n. So we could do something like for 21st partial sum, we would just calculate s sub 21 equals a over one minus r times one minus r to the 21st power. And again, a and r are coming directly from the way our geometric series was set up in the beginning of the problem. So a and r are some numbers, which means if we just raise that r to the 21st power, we will get that partial sum back that we want. But if we're interested in infinite series, what we're really interested in is basically what happens as n goes to infinity. So for 21st sum, we just plug in 21 everywhere. For infinite series, we take the limit. So this literally means we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity. Of s sub n. And on the right hand side, we're taking that limit too as n goes to infinity. So really what we have at this junction is that limit of as n goes to infinity, that partial sum is really giving us what our geometric series is going to equal in this case. Now remember, in this stage, we are only thinking of r as being between negative one and one, or r, the absolute value of r is less than one, or that r is strictly between negative one and one. So if we remember this fact, and we look at what's happening in the limit, well, if we take any number between negative one and one and raise it to the nth power and take the limit as n goes to infinity, well, that value there is going towards zero, which means, We come down here that this limit as s as n goes to infinity of our nth partial sum, this thing is actually equaling a over one minus r, which is some finite number. So the geometric series must converge. So again, to walk us back what just happened in these last two steps, when we took this limit as n goes to infinity of our nth partial sum, what this limit is actually giving us is the entire series itself. So this limit is actually giving us that series from n equals one to infinity of our geometric series. So basically what we just showed by taking that limit of the nth partial sum that we found was that that limit comes out to be a finite number for our partial sum value itself. So what we just showed was if r is between negative one and one, or the absolute value of r is strictly less than one, this geometric series must converge. And even beyond that, we get to say two things. Number one, if the absolute value of r is less than one, 
we first get to say proudly that this geometric series converges. The second thing we get to say is actually what it converges to. So and that it converges to A over one minus R. So what this really means though, is the sum of those infinite amount of terms in our geometric series, as long as R is less than one in absolute values, this series is going to be equal to A over one minus R. And that is the proof of the convergence properties for a geometric series.